This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I had mentioned that uh, one of the uh, delightful things to do with Marx is to sort of riff on some of his uh, ideas uh, in a contemporary circumstances and try to connect uh, his uh, theorizing with uh, what's going on around us in the here and now. Uh, one of the themes that comes up very strongly in the chapter of machinery is that the autonomy of the worker is uh, taken away by the factory system. Uh, the skilled worker was in control of their tools. They could, uh, you know, put them down, and if they didn't want to do work in a particular way, they they didn't do it. So they had a certain power simply by virtue of the fact that uh, their contribution to production was the skill in using a particular tool, and uh, this was, in one respect, a free gift of labor to to capital. But on the other hand, it was. Uh, it was one of those uh, uh, gifts, which is a little bit of a poison chalice, because once uh, capital accepts it, it has to accept the fact that uh, the laborer is autonomous and has, has the skill. But what happens with the machine is the skill is located inside of the machine. Uh, the autonomy in terms of the speed of the process is now located uh, outside the purview of the laborer. Uh, we get uh, the Charlie Chaplin modern times kind of picture of uh, an automaton in which uh, the laborer becomes, as Marx calls it, the append an appendage of the machine. So the laborer has to do uh, what the, s the machine wants the laborer to do, and they have to do it uh, at the speed which is set by the, by the machine. Now, this uh, thesis of the erosion of the autonomy uh, of uh, the worker is, of course, one which is well documented in the history of uh, capital. But I'm led to think about uh, the changing autonomy of the consumer. How autonomous are we in terms of our cons consumer choices? In what degree have we all actually become appendages of the capitalist production machine? Or, uh, and and uh, in, in effect, you could rewrite Marx's chapter about the machine uh, to, to talk about contemporary consumerism. Now, this came to me in a big way the other day when, for the first time, I walked around uh, this new area in New York City called Hudson Yards, which is the biggest real estate development, you know, in, I guess in the USA, perhaps even uh, in the world, though frankly, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it goes beyond what's going on in China uh, uh, at all. But the incredible thing about Hudson Yards is that you enter into it and there's a shopping mall. And you kind of say, well, why does New York need another shopping mall? The thing about the shopping mall is it's built with beautiful materials, large areas in which, through which you can walk. But there's no space to sit down unless you go into one of the coffee bars, restaurants, or whatever. Um, and it's, it's a very barren kind of environment. Beautiful in its own way, architecturally beautiful, but at the same time, kind of empty. And then you then say, well, how, how did this, this, this monstrosity of Hudson Yards get built? And it's interesting that uh, since its virtual completion in the last month, the, week, the, the commentary on it has not been very, very positive at all. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, mainstream art critics and architects and so on have been very, very critical of the, of the whole uh, thing. It represents uh, the expenditure of a vast amount of money. 
uh, and resources in terms of uh, the glass and you know and the, the the marble and and, and all the rest of it. All to make a space uh, which is, uh, you know, frankly not very inviting to be in. And I think most people feel that. So there are talk now of, well, we have to get more greenery in it. We've got to do more gardening. We've got to make it more sort of user-friendly. And they just opened a public space called The Shed, which is supposed to be a, a space of spectacle. But again, it becomes transparently obvious that the role of The Shed is to create uh, as many spectacles as possible so that people come into the space and then afterwards will wander into the mall and maybe buy, you know, eat something or, or buy something in, in, in the mall. So in a sense, it's, a, it's all about the manipulation of one's needs and desires. It's all about uh, building something in the image of capital. And this was how Marx talked about the factory system. He said the factory system was not built to, to lighten the load of labor. And in fact, he starts off the chapter on machinery by commenting on how is it that John Stuart Mill could not understand why it was that machinery which should lighten the load of labor actually ended up making it, you know, the labor process more and more oppressive. Well, we can say the same thing about something like Hudson Yards. Here, here, here is a situation in which capital is building something which to a casual observer should be about improving the qualities of life of the population. And, and, you know, and, and at the same time, all it really does is to actually present a symbolic presentation of the nature of what capital is about. It's a, it's a symbolic intervention not a real intervention. Of course, there are some people who are going to live there, but when you ask about housing prices, it's certainly not anything about affordable housing. Uh, and uh, most of the housing is, you know, very high quality for, you know, the, the, again, the top 1% top or the top 10%. And you then say to yourself, well, what would have happened if all of the resources that went into building this place had been actually put into the creation of affordable housing? What kind of city would we be living in? Furthermore, what would have happened had this gargantuan effort uh, been oriented to creating the possibility of consumer choice in terms of, for instance, ways of life, uh, ways of being. And it'll be interesting to see if the site gets occupied by people and, quote, civilized by actually turning it into a, a, a place in which something which is vibrant can go on. For, like, like Washington Square, for example, which is a, a public space where when the sun comes out, the uh, three bands appear and all kinds of you know, people on skateboards and all sorts of things. So, yeah, you know, people playing cards and whatever, you know, and the, the, uh, the chess players in the corner. I mean, there's a, there's a whole kind of life there. And it'll be interesting to see if anything like that transpires uh, within the space, because this can happen. Uh, I always think in Paris, for example, the Pompidou Centre, which is the art centre, which is a rather, you know, in itself, it's not a bad building, but it has a forecourt, which is the most forbidding and boring piece of architecture you can possibly imagine. But somehow or other, people get into it and turn it into a space uh, which is actually lively and actually... Uh, but that is going to also depend on the authorities tolerating certain degrees of freedom within the public spaces that there are there, such that uh, they are freely, can be freely appropriated by different people doing different things, in which case the space might actually become you know, a little bit interesting and a little bit livable. In other words, they built a space in the hope that somebody comes. Uh, I hope that somebody will come, the somebody that will come will actually civilize it and turn it into something which is very, very, uh, very, very different. But this, in, in, in effect, takes me back also to this whole kind of question 
uh, about the nature of daily life under capital. Marx had held that free time is one of the big indicators of an adequate society. Uh, Marx indicated that what we should be looking at is what he called uh, the, the, realm of, the realm of freedom. And that realm of freedom, he said, begins when the realm of necessity is left behind. So a good society is one where the realm of necessity is covered. Everybody has enough food and enough you know, clothing and enough housing and enough uh, employment, if, if need be, uh, to lead an adequate life. And then after that, everything is free time and people do what they like in whatever spaces that they like. In other words, what we're looking at here is the idea that there's going to be some sort of autonomy of how people use their time, how people consume their time. And that autonomy, it seems to me, is being steadily eroded by the invasion of capital, of everyday life taking away the autonomy uh, of time and certainly making it impossible for large segments of the population uh, to leave behind the realm of necessity. In fact, the large, largest segment of the population is struggling hard uh, to try to meet certain realms of necessity, which means that they have very restricted capacity uh, for freedom of, of uh, expression. Cities at their best are cities where there is a great deal of social autonomy, of social groups to do what they want and how they want to do it. But we, we again and again see the technologies and the capacities for those kinds of autonomies being eroded and taken away, removed. And this to me is again one of the sad parts of contemporary life, that what happens is that more and more time is taken up. More and more consumer choice is, is controlled. So that even something uh, like the internet, which I think is a very interesting sort of mini history, you know, what began as a kind of almost anarchistic peer-to-peer -peer, uh, creative uh, system uh, in which all sorts of innovations were, were going on, which were created by individuals in very, very often in partnerships and or in conversation with each other. Uh, and at a certain time also that uh, internet seemed to be a vehicle for you know, real social uh, advancement and social communication and social production and even in some instances social revolution, that process suddenly gets monopolized, suddenly gets placed under the aura of a business model. The business model starts to take over. So we get the Facebooks, we get the Googles, we get the Amazons, all of which are essentially monopolizing the qualities of daily life, and in inducing all sorts of forms of consumerism, which seem to me to, to be lack soul. They're like Hudson Yards. Looks great from a distance. You kind of, it looks like a shining city on a hill. It looks like the kind of uh, Oz that you can finally see. But when you get close, close up, uh, there's nothing, nothing much happening there, and there's nothing much that happens uh, emotionally, I think, to the population that circulates within it. Again, I don't want to say that, there's, that it's impossible that that space cannot be converted into something different. Populations do take control of their social spaces and give them a flavor and give them something, and they make uh, much of what a city is about when capital, actually, all it does is to uh, make this non-autonomous form of consumerism. Now, Marx doesn't spend too much time talking uh, about the consumer side of uh, consumer side of things. 
But this consumerism goes back to what I was saying in the last talk, which is that as the mass increases, so the question arises is where's the market for that mass? And how is that mass going to be absorbed through consumerism? As we increase the total amount of commodities, then obviously there must be a larger and larger population to consume those commodities. They must have the money to buy those commodities. All of this means that society has to be structured in some way around not only dealing with the tendency towards a falling rate of profit, but to deal with the difficulty of realizing the value of an increasing mass. And that increasing mass is now becoming more and more problematic. I frequently cite the case of uh, the cement consumption in China, uh, where China in you know, two years consumed 45% more cement than the United States consumed in 100 years. Now, this is, a, this is the rising mass. This is the increasing mass. This is an increasing mass of production of cement and consumption of cement. And then you kind of go, well, if the mass continues to increase, then we're going to be in problems. And I think this is one of the difficulties we're facing over global warming right now, because the increasing mass of commodities, the increasing mass that we're trying to control by, for example, suddenly trying to ban plastic bags because you know, the mass of plastic bags is sort of circulating in the oceans and we get these dreadful examples of a whale being, you know, dying on a beach and when its stomach is cut open, it's got about a ton and a half of plastic bags inside of it. So that increasing mass is something that has to be, has to be looked at. And that increasing mass is not only confronting the fact that it is putting increasing pressure on all of the resources that must go into producing that mass. So the, ex the, 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 the output of copper, the output of lithium, the output of, of, of iron ore has globally had to jump upwards, even under conditions of falling rates of profit. The mass is still rising, and the mass is increasing, and it does so at a compound rate. And, and the mass of, of, of all of those minerals, which are now being used in urbanization, and the mass being consumed, all of that mass, it seems to me, uh, has to be kind of understood as something which is necessary for the reproduction of capital. And we should always be asking the question, to what degree is this necessary for the reproduction of a way of life of the people? And what kind of way of life is it going to be? I'm fond of kind of saying that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what kind of cities we want to build. But I think the real question is not what kind of cities we want to build, but what kind of people do we want to be? Because that then in some ways defines what kind of city we would build. And frankly, I don't think I want to be the kind of person who would live in Hudson Yards without a good deal of civilizing influence, which is very hard to imagine, those very, very tall buildings somehow or other being taken over by uh, uh, the homeless population or, or, or you know, sort of uh, uh, punk rock groups or something of that, of that kind, which might make uh, the environment uh, uh, rather, more, rather more interesting. So the increasing mass and mass consumerism. And we've always regarded mass consumerism as somehow or other having a, a positive side with a kind of grumpy uh, undercurrent of discontent. Um, I think it should be the other way around, that in fact we should uh, approach uh, the whole kind of growth syndrome as a grumpy, uh, from the standpoint of a grumpy level of uh, discontent, uh, while at the same time suggesting that uh, decreasing and controlling the mass is actually one of, the, one of the big social tasks that we now now face. Precisely because, as many people are pointing out in the climate case, it is not too hard to say that things, once they reach a certain mass, 
are very, very difficult to control, and controlling the rate thereafter is irrelevant because the mass is already there doing the damage. And again, I think mass versus rate becomes significant, but also the, the whole issue of what, what, what would be called compensatory consumerism and consumerism that is fixated uh, on realizing the, the value in the mass no matter what, uh, and that, that kind of lifestyle, which, which also means that there's going to be more and more rapid turnover in, the, in that lifestyle, bringing us back to not only uh, the lifestyle of, which attaches to the labor process of neoliberalism, but which attaches also uh, to the consumerist principles of neoliberalism, which are very much about instantaneous gratification, instantaneous uh, trans transformations of, uh, of the world into instant gratifications. Speed up, for example, just to take one other example, speed up is integral to a capitalist mode of production. It's one of the ways in which I can get ahead of you in terms of uh, the output uh, that I have and uh, my competitiveness. If I move faster than you, I win. Therefore, there is a tremendous emphasis upon speeding things up, and the result of that is that most of us have to live much faster lives in terms of, 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 of everything. We have to consume faster. Uh, sort of relaxed, slow consumption. People like to think that it's possible to create an alternative society by talking about slow foods. Well, I like the idea of slow foods, but on the other hand, that's not how most people are going to be able to live, and that's not going to be a revolutionary movement by any means. But it does at least pose the kind of question of how the speed at which a society is working, this, the, 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 the way in which uh, that uh, uh, wants, needs, and desires are built uh, so that instantaneous uh, satisfactions are, are, are involved, where spectacle displaces real objects as objects of consumption, and the advantage of spectacle is that they are instantaneously over. And again, what we're going to see is an attempt to validate uh, Hudson Yards uh, by a continuous attempt to organize spectacle in the shed and various other places. I think there's a museum uh, coming there to, to try to organize spectacle uh, so that it, it helps to validate the rest uh, of, uh, of the environment. These are the, so in, ef in effect, what I'm saying here is this, that any analysis of capital has to think about rate, mass, speed, and the totality of relations within which rate, mass, speed, consumerism, labor processes are all being pulled together into a particular lifestyle, which I think for many people is alienating and, and alien and is producing at the same time as it proffers vast surface uh, satisfactions, uh, actually is producing uh, what seems to me an underlying uh, world of deep alienations and discontents. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.